Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship here in Kerry Duff. So whether you're meeting with us here in the meeting house, or joining us through the link in the hall, or even via YouTube later on, can we assure you of our, our, well, our very warm welcome to our service this morning. And especially if you're visiting with us this morning, you're, you've got a very special warm welcome with us. Our evening service again will be by a Zoom at 6.30 p.m. Andy again has kindly posted all those details and that service will be led uh, by the Reverend Graham Connor. As you're all aware, our Reverend Smith and Mrs. Smith continue to be on holidays until the end of August and we trust they will know much refreshment during this time of holiday. Please do remember them and uphold them in your prayers during this time. Uh, in a couple of weeks, they will be back with us. And during this time of holiday, uh, the Reverend Richard Patton of Trinity Board Mills is attending to our pastoral needs and concerns. So if you do need the service of a minister, please do feel free to, uh, to contact Richard. Uh, Andy again has posted his number on our social media outlets. And again, you do feel free to contact myself at any time or your district elder. And just a re reminder for those you might know are in hospital, do let us know about those who are in hospital or particularly ill. Sometimes word can be a bit slow coming back from the hospitals. So let us know if you do know of someone who is in hospital or particularly unwell, even at home. Let us know about that and we can organise a pastoral visit. We continue to remember those who in recent days have been bereaved in our fellowship, so do uh, remember to uphold them before the Lord at this time. And as you will know, uh, some of our nursing homes in the area have gone into lockdown again, so we are mindful of those in our nursing homes and residential care. Um, it's been a hard time, especially for those in nursing home and residential care at times they haven't seen many visitors or even family. So do continue to remember those in our number who are nursing and residential care. Next Sunday, our service will be led by Mr. Trevor Keane, who is the assistant in First Porter Down, and we look forward to him coming amongst us next Sunday. Thanks again to Sarah for leading our worship this morning, for the guys who are on the sound desk, and for our stewards who keep us safe every Sunday. Please do follow the directions they give. Um, showing you to your seat and, and, and you're leaving the meeting house, etc. And we thank those who tidy up and clean up every Sunday after us. Last Sunday, we were pleased to have Mr. John McCandless with us, and he left some of these wee leaflets with us. With us. Now, we ran out of them, but John kindly posted some more through my letterbox yesterday morning. So there were a number of people who were looking for those. They're out on the wee table as you go out. So do lift them this morning. It's a wee uh, illustration booklet, a wee track thing that John illustrated and there's basically the story of the Titanic is linked to a gospel message. So it's very, very good. If you like one of those, please collect one on your way out this morning. Incoming week sees the start of our Holiday Bible Club on your marks. So do remember that in our prayers. Again, the, the booking forms and all the details have been widely circulated on our social media outlets. So um, do continue to remember that and encourage our young people and children, if at all possible, to attend those meetings throughout the next week during the evenings, Monday to Friday. Again, one more we plug for risk assessment forms. At this stage, people really are tired of me plugging this. Some organisations haven't lifted these yet. It's very important that you do get them filled in and return to myself as soon as possible. That and the taking care uh, process must be undertaken before your organisation can meet. So. Do come and see me, get your risk assessment form. If you had one, get it back to me as soon as possible so I can check through it and sign it off and we can present these all before our session meeting on the 7th, I believe the 7th of September, our next session meeting in September. So do attend to that and get them back to me as soon as possible. And finally, it's my um, great pleasure to welcome back to our pulpit again the Reverend Dr. Graham Connor. He was with us over a period of time when our minister was on sabbatical we very much were appreciated and were blessed by his ministry then. Graham, we hope now you are a friend, I feel a friend among friends, and it's my delight to welcome you back to our meeting house this morning and to lead us in our worship. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, when I was a boy, one of my favorite TV programs on was uh, The Lone Ranger. And of course, there was always the question, this is for the oldies today, who was that masked man? 
and we've got used to answering that question. So I can say I look around and see familiar faces and masks today and old friends and I hope some new ones as well. It's lovely to be back with you and uh, I hope you're encouraged as we begin to get back to some kind of new normal in the not too distant future in terms of church life and activity and outreach. We're here to worship God today to remember that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together out of love, came into the world and God the Son to save us from our sins, to redeem our world, so that one day we can look forward to a, a time and a place where there is no more suffering or sorrow or sickness or death in the new heavens and the new earth. And we are called in the meantime to care for this world, to reach out to the lost and to show the love of Jesus to others knowing the day will come when we will reign with him forever and ever. So let's join together as we worship God. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, as we bow before you, as we acknowledge your presence with us, we are eager to come to worship you today, whether at home or whether here in the meeting house or in the hall. Lord, it's a tremendous privilege for us to encounter the living God. Indeed, it is life-changing for us. Without you, we have no hope of a future. We have no way of dealing with our past. And our present simply becomes a slog of day-to-day -day existence. But we praise you, Lord God, that you have come to our world in your Son, Jesus, and you come to our world by the Holy Spirit and live in amongst your people. We praise you this day that you're a God who comes and shows yourself to us, that you have shown us, Jesus, your Son, to be the fullness of the Godhead in a body. You've shown us, Jesus, to be the man, the human being that we all should be, and you've shown us, Jesus, the one who is victorious over sin and temptation and death and Satan and hell. Lord, we come to praise you as the almighty God, the one who holds everything that is life and energy in your hands. Indeed, it's through you that we live and move and have our being. We cannot create our breath, nor can we beat our hearts by ourselves. You have given us life and you maintain that life. And we thank you for that, Lord, that since last we met or worshipped you as a group of people, you have been good to us, blessing us and doing us good. We thank you for one another, for the church of Jesus, not just here but around the world, that from every generation and every place you are calling men and women and boys and girls to follow Jesus, to discover the way that leads to life everlasting, and to find in him our all in all. And we thank you that today around our world many people will come to know Christ, and millions and millions of others will continue to follow him until you call us home. Lord, we bless you for that, and we pray that as you come to us now and we realize our need of you, we pray you will forgive us our sins. Lord, sometimes we knowingly rebel against you and your ways. Sometimes we rob you of your glory because we disown your name. Sometimes we give in to temptation that makes us less than human and hurts others. Sometimes just through ignorance or neglect or laziness, we do not step up to the mark and do what you've called us to do and be what you've called us to be, the light of the world. We praise you that we can come to you knowing Jesus, our Savior, has paid the price for our sins and not just the sins of the world. Our Father, it amazes us that he would take our place on the cross and die the death that we should die, that we might live the life that he lived and know you and enjoy you forever. Lord, help us to follow the way of Jesus, that your light might shine not only in us to change us, but by the way we live and think and will, that your light will shine in our world through us and all your people this day and this week. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us with worship. 
Help us to meet with the living God that we might express in our hearts and by our thoughts and our words how much we love you more than all the good things you give to us. For you're our God and in Jesus you are our life. We praise you and worship you and ask that you will fill us with your spirit afresh. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, our reading today is found in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, and I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's a psalm that many of us will, will be familiar with and, and will know very well. And we thank God for his word. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we thank God for his word, and we continue to Worship that God as we keep our seats and sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
Well, boys and girls, it's good to see you here, and I know there's others watching on. Um, a few weeks ago, I went with my grandchildren to a place I hadn't been for a long time in Armagh, to the planetarium. And I really enjoyed going back. It's very different now from when I went. I think I went not long after it opened to the public. I don't know when that was. But it's really a fancy place now with lots of toys. And I have a grandson who's seven and a, a grandson who's seven and a granddaughter who's six. And particularly my grandson, he's really interested in, in science and all the different things. So he had a ball playing all the different games that you play. And then we went into what was like a little theater and we watched a show and we looked up into the sky, well, the, the, the top of the theater and all kinds of things went on there. Some amazing things. Uh, one of, sort of two movies. One of the movies started off on earth Start off a bit like this. When I, was, when I was a boy, this is one of the things I had in my room, a globe, and it used to turn around, and I used to think of all the wonderful places in the world and spot where I was, and little did I know that I would get to visit so many of the places in the world, right across to Japan, way over here, and right across to the other side of the United States, away over here, and I've been down here to Brazil, and of course I've been to Afghanistan and India, and Thailand, away out that way. Never been to Africa. That's one of the places I'd like to go to. Whether I get there or not, I don't know. But the world seems big to us, don't we? And we know it's spinning fast. And this, this uh, movie that we saw in the planetarium started with the world and started moving out from the world. And, and what would have been the first thing you moved out from the world and came near? Does anybody know? Anybody know at all? What would be the first thing, the nearest thing to Earth that's out in space? Anybody know? Well, of course, it's the moon, isn't it? Sometimes we can see the whole moon, sometimes part of it. So we went past the moon, and then we were going further out and out. We went past Mars, and then I think it was Jupiter and uh, Saturn, and then lots of, uh, what were they called? I can't, I can't remember. Lots of little, tiny little planets, and then out to the farthest planets. And believe it or not, we were only just starting. And we went further and further and further out. We saw uh, galaxies and we saw uh, black holes and we saw all kinds of things that people have seen with these amazing telescopes that are on the world. And it made me think of just how wonderful is our God who made such a universe. When we start to look at what we can see. And when we think of what God has made, it, it's quite amazing that out there there's galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. And then I was reminded of that because there was a program on just recently about the first men who landed on the moon and they were reenacting that. And Pat and I sat and watched that because we were teenagers when that happened. And it was such an exciting thing to see people land on the moon. And yet there's so much, so much more. The earth spins round, and the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the first thing he created, I wonder, can you remember, was light. The light shone into the darkness, and then God thought, oh, I need to separate the waters that are on the heavens from the waters on the earth. And so he separated them, and he made the sky. And then on the earth... He made the oceans and the sea and the dry land between them. And he covered the dry land with flowers and trees and grass. And then he stopped for a moment and he said, you know, that's good. But he didn't stop there. He created the sun and the moon and the stars and they were beautiful. And after he had done that, he said, that's good and good it is. Beautiful they are. If you go down there, you'll just see how beautiful some of those stars are and the planets and then he created on earth the birds and the fish and he blessed them and he told them to multiply so that more and more of them would fill the earth. And he, he made beautiful birds and they began to multiply too and he said, that's good. And then finally, he made the animals, animals like the tall skinny giraffes and the furry little squirrels that run about. He made cuddly little kittens and big ferocious lions, animals of every kind. And finally, he made man and woman. 
And he says he made them to be like him. And he put them in charge of everything he had made. They were to care for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature. And at the end, God didn't just say it was good. He said it's very good. Very, very good. Everything that I've made. And he rested. I go on a walk nearly every day. Probably this afternoon, if it's not raining, I'll go on a walk. And one of the things I've tried to do recently since I came back from the planetarium is when I'm out walking, I try now and again to say, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that good? And God made it. On the walk that I walk, sometimes I see little snails going along and my my grandson is very keen on snails at the minute and uh, they've hatched out eggs and the little baby snails are all around i'm not so keen and certainly pat who gardens isn't just so keen in the snails but there they are and i can see the snails crossing my path and i want you to think about going out for a walk the next time you go out for a walk think about the things that you can see that are good that god has made that are very good one day on my walk I saw a fox, and weeks later, I saw a little baby fox crying out for the fox, crying out for his mother. And we had to get help so that the little fox would be looked after. God has made so many things, and they're very good. And then our psalm tells us that he has put us in charge of caring for his world, and we haven't always done a good job of that. And I hope, boys and girls, as you grow up, you'll care for the world even better than those of us who are old that you'll look after it. You'll look for the things that are beautiful and good and you'll keep them and care for them. And the things that are bad and ugly because our world has fallen and broken, that you'll get those things to be less and less and less in the future. Do you remember what the psalm said? You made him, that's us, ruler of the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. God has created it. It's good and we are to care for it. Let's try to do that. Let's just pray for a moment before we sing. Heavenly Father, there is so much beauty in our world, so many things that stagger us. And then when we begin to think about our universe, of our solar system and the galaxies that are out there and all the mysterious things that people have still yet to discover, how vast it is. And you made it all just by speaking. Lord, you're a great God. We live in a very special world where things like trees and plants can grow, where animals and cereal and fruit and other crops can feed us. In a world where we can breathe clean air and drink pure water, all the things that we need to live, Lord, you've cared for us in every way. And you have asked us to look after it. Help us to do that. Help us to do that to show how much we love you because you are a great God. We owe you our lives. And Lord, help us as we go out walking and even driving in the car to look for things and say, God made that. God gave us that how good it is. O oh Lord, our Lord, how wonderful and majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Now we're going to sing together, God, you are good to me, not just in what he has made for us and gives to us, but of course, especially in his son Jesus and coming to be our savior and friend. God, you're good to me.
Well, let's stand to pray together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that in this psalm, though you have created a vast universe, the psalm tells us that you care for every single person that is inhabited and does live in our world. And so we thank you that day in and day out we can come to you to pray for the people that we know and love the best, for our family and neighbors and friends, for our church family, for our land, and then for our world and for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that we can say that you've been our shepherd all the days of our lives, that even before you were bor we were born, you had set your heart on loving us and doing us good. We thank you for the families in which you placed us and for the families that still surround us and pray for them near and far, that your good hand will be on them, protecting them and keeping them well, helping them to study at school, to work, caring for those that are elderly and particularly infirm. And we pray for um, places in the neighborhood where there have been outbreaks of COVID and people can no longer visit their relatives and friends. We pray even now, Lord, that you will draw near to your people in those homes and remind them of how much you love them in these moments just now. And that you will help staff and residents to continue to live life as fully as they possibly can and soon to open their doors and welcome others safely in. We remember to those who mourn and those who feel the separation from their families because they live uh, isolated and far from others and cannot see them in person. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, people who feel the distance from relatives and friends might know just the closeness of your love and your peace. And we thank you for technology that helps us see and be part of one another's lives, even for a short time. Remember to those who are long-term ill at home and those who care for them. And for the difficulties in that kind of relationship and for the energy that's needed. Lord, we pray that you will pour hope into those who feel at times they have no hope or future. For those who are continually tired and weary. For those who are cared for and those who care. Lord, may they know that underneath and around are the everlasting arms who care far more than we can ever do and ever imagine. Remember Alistair, Lord, and the elders as they continue to lead this congregation out of lockdown. We pray that you will grant them wisdom and courage and faith. And we pray particularly for the Holiday Bible Club this incoming week. We pray that many boys and girls and young people will enjoy hearing of Jesus, receiving Jesus, and growing in Christ, and being effective witnesses to their friends as they soon return to school and to college and to work. Remember our world and all its brokenness and sadness. We pray again for the people in Haiti as they try to build and reconstruct their villages and towns and deal with those who have died and their bodies and the many, many people who are seeking hospital at this time and those that are confused, orphaned, those who have no home to turn to. We think of the people of Afghanistan, Lord, and pray for your people there. We pray you will keep them safe and that in these dreadful days that your light will shine through them and that others might indeed see Jesus Christ, whether by vision or by example or through your word. And all the mayhem, Lord, protect people, we pray. And we would ask that a government might be formed that would seek to bring peace, much to the amazement of the other nations around, and that people would grow and seek to be carers of one another and kind to one another. Father, we remember places in our world that deal with diseases that we have long forgotten. And for those who care for them in stretched hospitals with limited resources, and pray that you would multiply their work and their ability to work and bring healing. Father, we thank you for vaccinations, but we continue to pray for those that are in danger and COVID 
and pray that you will keep us safe and help us to be wise in the way that we live. We long for the day when the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we pray, Lord God, that we might see signs of that in our day. As your kingdom grows, as men and women and boys and girls come to faith in Jesus in this land and across the world, that many might see and fear and know that the Lord is God and come to Jesus for salvation. Finally, we pray for ourselves, Lord, that you will be to us more than all we ever need, forgiving our sins, strengthening us, helping us overcome evil with good, and praying that our light might shine in a dark world and Christ might be with us and in us and offered through us to others. In his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat>One of the great things about retirement is that you have more time in your hands. Isn't that the theory, at least? And one of the things that my wife has kindly taken from me is doing the weekly shop. Um, I think there's more than just uh, a fact that she doesn't think I can do it right, and she's right about that, but I think she actually enjoys doing it, which is a strange thing to me because it always seemed like a job. But I did get cute with the, the big uh, supermarkets, I realize that they're geared up for right-handed people. I don't know if you know that. But I found out that when you go up and down the aisles, the things that they really want you to buy are always on the right-hand side. The ones that they really you know, make profit on and they want turnover are on the right-hand side, which is great for us because Pat's left-handed. So we're probably saving a lot of money. And then, of course, there's all the wonderful packaging. Some of us are old enough to remember when tins were plain and uh, it was hard sometimes to guess what was in them and you just had brown paper bags and you'd carry them home with you. But now the packaging is bright and engaging and, of course, we have to all care for it and make sure that it can be recycled. It's there to catch the eye and draw us in. The packaging is so important. Well... Psalm 8 has packaging, doesn't it, at either end of the psalm, if you want to turn and look at it. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There's the packaging, front and back of this wonderful psalm, and it's meant to draw our attention to the psalm. It's meant to be, here is something that you just can't walk past, something that needs to catch your attention and something that you need to hold dear in your life. Some of us, of course, were taught this psalm either in the AV version or in the metrical version, maybe in school or in Sunday school. It's one of those psalms like Psalm 23 and Psalm 46 and so on that we were taught when we were boys and girls. David wants us to be excited about the majesty of God. He wants us to use our lives to adore him. Because if we don't, we will have missed out on what human life is all about. And he gives us reasons in the psalm why we should be taken up with the Lord's majesty. And I want to take a few moments to think about them here in the psalm. And the first is the irony of the strength of God. You find it at the end of verse 1 and verse 2. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babes, Babies and infants, you've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. We should adore God because of his strength. Of course, there's an irony in this verse because he goes on to say that it's little babies and children that can point to that and can tell others who seem to be strong in this world that, in fact, they're weak. We get irony, don't we? Uh, we've had a lot of people in and out working at our house. When we took it on and we moved a couple of years ago, we didn't know lockdown was coming. And we have discovered that in lockdown, um, people who do odd jobs, people who are skilled around houses, well, they're like hen's teeth to get, but they're as busy as can be. Busy, busy people. And it's wonderful to have them in and to get a job done and get a job done well. 
and really enjoy seeing how it's done. But there's an irony, isn't it? Because often a carpenter, well, the doors in his own house don't hang on the hinges. Or a plumber, we get the irony of a plumber that has a leaky water tap and never gets around to fixing it. And yet we hear stories of that over and over again. Or maybe in a different field of a tax inspector who's caught for tax evasion. We get irony, don't we? And David gives us irony here. He says that although the Lord's strength is splashed all over the heavens, although he has established his strength so that all can see it, yet it's out of the mouths of children and infants of all things that we can discover that truth. Here's the contrast, you see, between the foe, the enemy, the seeker of revenge, the children and infants stand before these macho brutes and who flex their muscles, show off their tattoos, and here are these little babies. The point is this, that what seems inconsequential overcomes the mighty. What seems little and unimportant actually overwhelms what seems strong. Who would have thought in the days of the Roman Empire a little baby born in a stable would be the savior of the world who would change people forever. Who would have thought that God would devise a plan in coming into the world in the form of a human being with all the risks that are involved in those centuries long ago of a little, a young woman giving birth to a baby outside a hospital, no hospitals there. And then that baby going into obscurity and being brought up as a little boy, and cared for as a youth and a young man. Who would have thought that God would do it? What strength is it that God establishes from the mouths of children and infants? Well, of course, it's the strength of praise, isn't it? The way the Greeks took this Old Testament and translated it into what was called the Septuagint, one of the early Greek uh, Bibles, they said that it's speaking of the praise of God. Praise packs a punch, When we praise God and stand before others and lift up his name and honor his name, it is strong even though others think it should be weak. There's a strange wallop in the praises of God by his people that silence his enemies. You can maybe think of Old Testament examples. The fall of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, as the people surrounded the walls. What did they do? They held a worship service. They praised God and the walls fell down and in they went and Jericho was defeated and there's other examples of that. My mind, of course, has been going back to Afghanistan quite a bit over these last few weeks and I haven't been surprised by what has happened, but I can think of stories more stories than I have time to tell you of how God used the weak things of this world to overturn the strong. Let me tell you one of a man called Omar who since died. Omar was brought up in Turkey. He was a Muslim. He was a very famous architect and worked with some of the most famous architects in the world. He had uh, spent a little bit of time as a boy in Afghanistan because his father was a physics professor there way back in the 50s. And we met Omar over a period of time, got to know him, and were able to lead him to the Lord. And Omar began to become a follower of Jesus. Dangerous thing in that country. Omar was involved in business, and his business went upside down. His partner uh, tricked him and took the money. And uh, the government and his, uh, the people that the business owed money to came looking for him. And he was thrown into the famous Puli Charki, the, the big prison that's just outside on the edge of Kabul near the airport. Uh, prisoners have been released recently, and Omar was put in there. He would have been a man in his mid-60s by then uh, when he went in there. Uh, he took one thing with him as as well as the clothes on his back, and that one thing was a New Testament. He was determined in Pulicharki to tell others that he had forsaken the way of Islam and he had come to know Jesus, not just as a prophet, but as Savior and Lord. And you can't think of anybody more weak than that. A man who was elderly by that culture standard, a man who had been broken in his business, who had lost his family, and a man who wasn't terribly well, to put it on top of it, 
And what did they do to him? Well, when they discovered that he was a follower of Jesus and he told them they beat him up, the guards beat him up, the other prisoners beat him up, and he was really quite ill, and we were praying for him for a long time. And one Friday was we were worshipping. This was months after uh, Omar had gone into prison. Um, we were worshipping in the house where we worshipped. There were two doors behind me. And as I got up, uh, as I finished preaching, one of the doors behind opened and Omar walked in. It was like being in the New Testament all over again. And uh, God's prayers had been answered. He had been released. And you know what happened in that prison the day he was released? Many of the prisoners and many of the um, guards wept. And they told Omar, they said, Omar, you have told us the words of life. You have told us about a savior, and we need that savior. God uses the weak things of this world to astound the strong. The humblest of believer, praising and living for God, is immensely strong before a watching world. So here's the first thing. Our God is majestic, the irony of his strength. And then secondly, the mystery of his care. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man? What is a human being that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? We are to adore God because of the mystery of his care. Don't you know that in your life? I know that in mine how God has cared for me and cared for you in all kinds of ways. Some of them we don't even know, but some of them we do. And it's amazing to us that this God who has created all the universe, who is majestic in all power and glory, cares, stoops down to care for us. Of course, for David, his world is not a secular world. He describes the world in words like, your heavens the works of your fingers, the heavenly bodies that you have put in place. God hasn't vacated David's world. God directs David's world. On a clear night in the countryside in Israel, David probably could have seen two or 3,000 stars. If he'd been able to have a pair of binoculars, believe it or not, he might have been able to see up to 100,000 stars in that same place where there's very little light to, to rob you of seeing the stars. What if David knew that if the Milky Way galaxy was the entire continent of North Africa, our solar system would be like a little coffee cup in a room somewhere in North America? And that the Milky Way is one of perhaps a hundred billion such galaxies in the universe. It's staggering, isn't it? He would have been even more staggered than he was at looking at the majesty of our God and the vastness of the world and the universe he's made. And he considers all of that. It's impressive. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. And yet he says, you pay attention to people, to a person like me. You show concern for me. Think of that as you sit here, either in the meeting house or at home or wherever you're, you're tuning into this service, that God cares for you. Forget about the other billions of people, for you. David just was baffled by it, but was joyous. He was perplexed that in this vast universe, God is concerned for each individual per person. And we know part of the reason is because he has created every person in the image of God. And you can see how it angers and grieves God when we misuse someone else, even if it's just being jealous of them or gossiping about them, because here is someone created in the image of God that God cares for. God holds the vastness of the universe and the individual in his hands. There's a story told about Mozart. He was once accosted in the street by a beggar in Vienna. And the composer had no money to give the beggar, and so he brought the beggar to a coffee house where Mozart quickly dashed off a piece of music, a minuet and trio, I've been told it was, a short piece of music. And he gave them to the fellow along with a letter saying who had written it and asking him to take it to the publishers and to take whatever money the publishers would give for the piece. 
And before long, this astonished tramp had five guineas, which was a lot of money then. Why did Mozart not give him the brush off? Why should that person matter to him? Why take care to invest time and effort with someone else? Well, the psalm tells us, what is man or the son of man? Why should a mere speck of dust on the light years of God's calendar matter to him? David has no doubt that he does matter to God. He's baffled by the why. He hasn't yet met Jesus as we have who came to seek and to save the lost, shepherd for the sheep, the woman for the coin, the father for lost sons. What is man? And he doesn't really get an answer, but what he does say, what a God we have. We worship God. We declare his name to be majestic through the irony of his strength, the mystery of his care, and then thirdly, the clarity of his revelation. You have made him a little lower than the heavy beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. David tells God that he is majestic, because he has revealed himself so clearly to David and to others. Why is it that David knows that God pays attention, that God cares about this creature made of dust, that a human being matters to him? Well, David's answer is the same answer as we should have, because the Bible tells us so. And he gives us this wonderful poetic summary of Genesis 1, 26 to 35. God cares for us, and he's clearly shown us this. He could have gone on to tell the history of Israel up to that point, but he didn't have to. And yet some people never appreciate home until they run away from it, do they? And some people never really appreciate the Bible, and they run away from it for many years. What is man? Well, it hushes David with wonder, and joy. Think of some of the other answers to that question, what is a human being today? There's the answer of paganism, whether it's in David's day or in our day. A man on the street who is a pagan would say, when I look at the heavens, the moons, and the stars, I fall down and worship them, for I believe they represent the powers of the universe. They're moody and unpredictable, yet I'm caught in their crunch, for they control my fate. So it was in David's day that people worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars and even the trees. So it is in our day that the first thing people look up is what their day is going to be like because they're told by some astrologer what it's going to be like. Oh yes, we still make gods out of all kinds of things, don't we? We're not that sophisticated. These people would say that human beings are accidents. We're really slaves. We're servants and Cares for the gods. The work that we do is drudgery, and they give us enough to feed us, to meet our needs. That's what a pagan would say. And I must do everything I can to appease this god or to follow this astrologer or that. Or the, the nihilists who were uh, about very much between the wars and after the Second World War. What is a human being in the vastness of the universe? He's nothing. He's just a lump of dust that appears for a while and disappears. There's something of that, isn't there, amongst our young people uh, as they seek um, adulation from their peers at school or maybe at work or in unemployment, and so many of them turn to drugs, and sadly, many of them turn to taking their own lives. What am I? I'm just a bunch of cells. I'm here for a while and then I'm gone. That's what people tell me. I'm junk. Samuel Beckett, who was a playwright, wrote a, a very short play called Breath. It's an amazing play. It's not seen on stage at all, I think. It's only 35 seconds long and there's no human actors in the play. The play starts with a pile of rubbish sitting on a stage, lit by a light that is dim at first and gets brighter, but never fully so, and then it becomes dim again. There's no words 
At the start, there's a recorded cry, an intake of breaths, an exhaling of breaths, another recorded cry, and that's it. Beckett, you see, was saying that human beings are just rubbish that can breathe for a moment, and then they're gone. And sometimes the way people treat one another, we know that's what we really think of other people. They're here to be used, and then they're gone. Or think of the humanist who denies there is a God at all. In 1973, the Humanist Manifesto was defined by this. We believe that traditional theism, that's belief in God, especially faith in the prayer-hearing God, assume to love and care for people, to hear and understand their prayers, and to be able to do something about them is an unproved and outmoded faith. And they went on to write, we can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. What were they saying? Human beings are alone. Is, it, is that part of the, the search for other species like us somewhere out there in another galaxy? Is that the whole science fiction movement and the wonderful uh, films that are made now? How sad that is, alone. But we have the answer of God's revelation found in these verses 5 to 8. David knows that humanity counts because someone has spoken from outside into humanity. Someone who speaks from outside who is royal. Someone who said, let us make human beings in our image after our likeness and let them rule. We don't take this position because we've figured it out somehow or reasoned it. No, God stooped down and spoke into us just as he had made us. And what a difference that makes in our lives day in, day out. Even the assumptions we make. Even the worries that we don't have to have anymore. Think of Jesus' words in Luke 12. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you then than the birds? Psalm 8 and Genesis 1 say amen to that. We see birds killed in the sight of motorways and roads, don't we? Our Heavenly Father sees this and cares for us and sustains us because there's no comparison between ravens and royalty and that's what we are called to become and to be. One more thing that this psalm tells us about the majesty of God and this is it, the certainty of God's plan. It's in verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. David's saying, I want to praise you and worship you because of the certainty of your plan, God. I want us to think of that verse and draw in what the writer to the Hebrews made of it and others in a moment. It's all very uh, nice, you might say, Graham. In the middle of COVID, it's a bit difficult to really believe that. It's very hard to believe that all and everything has been placed under human feet that we are to rule all things. We can't even rule the weather that we get, the rain that comes. We can't stop the tides coming and going. It seems to me, Graham, that cancer rules and tragedy rules and COVID rules and political tyrants rule. But the letter to the Hebrews helps us to see it through the right lens. He takes Psalm 8, including verse 6, and he says, you know, we don't see that yet, but we see Jesus. His argument is, no, we don't see God's plan in its final form. We don't see it in full technicolor, but we do see this one man, Jesus, who reigns over everything. And note that the writer of the Hebrews deliberately uses his human name. He's wanting us to think of Jesus' humanity. Because of his suffering and his death as a human being as well as being the Son of God, he has been crowned with glory and honor and reigns above all the whole created order. And the promise is to us that he will bring many children to reign with him in glory. Humanity as such doesn't yet enjoy the roadmap of Psalm 8. But you see, one man does. 
and gives hope to our humanity. In Michael Green's book that I think he wrote in the 70s called The Empty Cross of Jesus, he alludes to the speculation in European circles during the Middle Ages about whether there was a sea route to India from Europe, a way to, to the land of the spices around the southern tip of Africa that would make it so much easier to trade back and forward with that amazing place of India. There had been lots of attempts to get round the south of Africa and they had failed, so much so that the Cape, the bottom part of the south of Africa, was called the Cape of Storms. So many boats had tried to get round, and they had uh, fallen on the rocks and on the Cape and fallen apart, and people hadn't survived. But one sailor was determined to try once more, and he succeeded in rounding the Cape and getting to the east. And ever since Vasco da Gama sailed back to Lisbon and triumphed with those spices and other wonderful things, it has been possible to get to India around the south. Of course, people now use the Suez Canal. But no one any longer could doubt that you could get to India by sea. And you went round what is now called the Cape of Good Hope. The Cape of Good Hope was the new name given to it. And that's the point of Hebrews 2 comment on Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is not a pipe dream. No, we don't see it fully blown yet. We don't see it in all its color and glory. But we see Jesus, one man who is already reigning. And that assurance is for all who are redeemed, that we too will reign with him forever and ever and ever. As Revelation 5 and 10 puts it, he made them. And if you're a follower of Jesus, let me put it this way. He made you and all other followers of Jesus a kingdom, priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. We shouldn't doubt our royal future when this man, Jesus, our king, has already begun enjoying it. You remember the wrapping? With this I finish. Why don't we say today, in our hearts. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Let's close with the words of wonderful hymn that fits this theme so well, Sammy, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. We sit to sing.
And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.